So it's going to introduce uh, data conversations, which is um, the um, method that we have at Lancaster to um, uh, engage researchers. And I tell you the kind of library perspective and Jude, the, uh, what the researcher one. So for, for those of uh, you who are from further afield, not familiar with uh, Lancaster, we are a mid-sized uh, university in the northwest of England. You can see our campus here. Um, we are a um, research intensive university. The kind of audience I deal with, uh, you can see here the numbers, about 1,200 academic staff and then 1,500 um, research students. Um, of course, we have an institutional data policy. We also have what we call the research registry, which is a, our data um, repository now with 190 data sets since I've written these slides. And uh, the support team in our university is um, about two full-time equivalents. So that's myself and then bits and pieces of other colleagues. So not that many if you, if you consider our audience. And, um, like, <clears throat> like many other universities, we started our research data management um, messages in a kind of a top-down approach. So we send um, from senior management in the university very compliance-driven messages to our academics, basically saying in order to be compliant with our institutional policy or funder policies, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Now, we did this for a while and realized the success that we had or we felt we had was quite limited. So we thought, well, how can we do this? And are we the only ones who are experiencing this? So we, we did here a study in um, May this year where we asked about 60 universities, uh, <coughs> what works for you? What, um, comp and basically it's top down versus engagement. And you can see um, here um, the results. And just look at the, the blue pie is the successful one. And the left one is the top down. You can see it does work to a certain extent, but 40%. Then a few mixed results, the green uh, uh, chart, and then um, failure. And then compare that with engagement. So this is not what we think at Lancaster. This is what the 60 universities who responded to this survey thought. So you can see there's clearly some evidence that engagement as a method um, works better than the top down um, messages. So what did we do the next? Well, we thought about this <coughs> event called Data Conversations. The concept is actually quite basic. It's an event that we organize three times a year. Um, we get usually about 25 to 30 researchers coming along, um, doing four to six lightning talks. We have an open call for that. So um, we, um, so, so far we haven't, uh, so the, the, uh, the speaker slots were filled naturally, if you want, not by us um, kind of nudging people. Uh, it's a two-hour event, and it starts with a lunch, so there's a net, strong networking uh, element to it. So we think it's a platform where researchers can talk about open data and data management, um, but it's um, well based on their research. So the, the point here, it's not an, an RDM event. It's an event about where, where researchers talk about their data, their practices, and we think that facilitates um, peer-led um, support for aspects of the research process, including RDM. So the data management uh, messages are implicit rather than talking about, oh, you need to do X, Y, and Z, or this is how you write a data management plan. We think it also um, encourages interdisciplinary research um, and sparks new ideas, and we have some evidence for that <coughs> as well. Um, so we've, we've done, as I said, four, um, three events already. Um, it always starts now with free food, and you know, pizza does work. Um, we, we get that in our feedback that people like to come early and then have a meal. Um, the themes that we had so far, you can see here. So very, we started very broad data sharing, then went on to data security and confidentiality. Uh, and then the last one that we had was software as data. And we've just um, kind of planned the next one in January, which is called Open Data, Open Doors. Now this is the agenda of the first event that we had. So you can see um, the talks that we had were very broad from also from the, um, the background of, of um, the speakers, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, from linked data to um, sensitive data, um, visualization, um, GIS, et cetera. So that was quite a broad range. And again, this was not facilitated by us. There was an open call and we were 
I guess, kind of lucky that we had this wide range of um, talks. Um, we do make a point that this is an informal event, so we don't use a lecture theater, but you know, a, a nice room that we have in the library with um, tables. As I say, we start with lunch. Um, and the networking element at the, the start, in the middle, and at the end is, is quite strong. And we know from our feedback that this is what our um, participants really appreciate. We do, of course, make all the slides available. We block about it. And now we actually have a kind of a spin-off um, <coughs> in terms of data. We call this data interview. So the data conversations are these events. But now we, we started interviewing um, presenters that we find particularly interesting and then transcribe that, that interview. So it's very limited um, time needed by the academic. But they, they get a nice blog post over it, out of it. And we think that these interesting um, presentations then lead into something that everybody can read up on. Right, and now over to you, Jude. Thank you. Um, hi, good morning. So I'm really interested in data. I like to talk about data. I like to think about data. I'm also, I think, still relatively <coughs> unusual in British sociology in that I work with quantitative data. Um, and I found that people have particular conceptions about what data is and what data is not. And if you're not working with the right kind of data, you don't fit into the right pigeonhole. Um, I work on violence, so I work with a lot of big survey data and I work with a lot of police data. I'm particularly interested in measurement. And when I first kind of thought about data conversations or heard about them, I was quite nervous because my first encounter with data science, I was told that I didn't work with data that the data I was using didn't count, wasn't the right kind of data, and I thought, mm, okay, I'm gonna go to a data conversation. Will I have anything in common? Will we be talking about anything that I recognize? And when I got there, the th I think the really fantastic thing about the data conversations at Lancaster is that they don't have an exclusive interpretation of data. So in the very first session, I think we said there was people from every faculty people from every faculty across Lancaster. So arts, humanities, and social science, management, uh, uh, science and technology, and health. And that was so useful and so interesting. Um, it meant that we could share practice. It meant that we talked about data in a really interesting way because people brought up all sorts of things that were really relevant, but in a completely different field. Um, and what is also really interesting is that it attracts researchers who are at very different stages. So in the last data conversation, there was a lot of um, PhD students. And the way that they were interacting with their data, the challenges they had and the solutions that they were finding, were actually really different to the way some of us academics were meeting challenges or the resources that we had access to, or the networks that we were plugged into that gave us new ideas. So, the diversity of people that go, both in terms of disciplines, in terms of job roles, and in terms of the stage that they're at, I think makes a real difference. It makes it really, really valuable. Going the right way? Yeah. Okay. Now, the data conversations, they're quite informal, but nevertheless, there's a kind of formal process and a less formal process. So, formally, they're really useful. They're a really good way to gain new knowledge find out about things that you just didn't know. Um, they're an opportunity to ask questions. People are really open with the information that they share. And I found it a really good way to generate new ideas and new research. I met somebody um, from computer science who's interested in inbuilt biases in algorithms, um, especially facial rec recognition at airports, which is not the same as my work, but I do a lot of work on terrorism. So we have things to talk about. It kind of brings me on to the informal stuff. It's really hard to meet people at a big university on the day-to-day -day busyness. So having something like a data conversation really enables you to meet people that you otherwise wouldn't have time to sit down and talk to. And that's been incredibly valuable. Um, 
It's also helped me to find out more about uh, relevant research and research practices across the university, so things that are happening in different departments or different faculties that would be useful to my research, we've been able to make links on. Um, and making connections for further conversations. So, for example, I think the open data agenda is really important. Replicability, um, transparency. But most of the data I work with is actually subject to increasing security. So more and more and more security measures. Uh, my police data, I'm level three vetted, had to sign the Official Secrets Act. Uh, Crime Survey for England and Wales I work with has now moved into a secure hub. You have to pass a day's training in London to be able to access the hub. It has to be from a desktop computer. You can't do it on a laptop. It has to be in a room with the door that locks and no public access. So I think that some areas have real challenges to think about in terms of open data, transparent, transparency and replicability. And actually what the data conversations have done have brought together people with the same challenges but in very different areas. And we've been able to learn from that how people have kind of overcome these different types of challenges. And that's been really, really useful. Um, and finally, I just want to say that I think there's a real benefit from being able to talk to other people who are enthusiastic about data. <laughs> right. Most people, when you start talking about data, kind of roll their eyes or they humor you for a little bit. But being in a room full of people who are really enthusiastic about data, it's, it's just glorious, actually, sometimes. <laughs> it's really, really, I think, beneficial. And I think it really moves forward the work that we're doing in this area. OK, so I think we're running out of time. So um, to our conclusions, um, right, so the feedback so far you can see was encouraging. We have a diverse audience. Um, we have created more opportunities. For example, um, Jude is now one of our two uh, data champions. We have, um, we have sparked some research collaborations. So um, people who, as Jude mentioned, who have seen each other's research and now are collaborating. There's also a, um, a grassroots initiative in our psychology department called PROSPER, promoting open science practices that specifically refer to data conversations as um, a kind of a link. Um, Right, sorry, do you want to do that? Yeah, and, um, and I think also it's helped us to disseminate knowledge about uh, research data management. So just a, a really quick example. From going to the data conversations, I've just written a new master's module on critically thinking about data, and I specifically wrote into that research data management and linked it to how you think about your data, how you make your research more, ro more robust, and then from that, I also know that my master's students on that course are now signed up to the January data conversations. So hopefully that kind of spins out across the university as people start to embed it in things like new modules, special events for researchers and postgraduate students. OK. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Same, isn't it? <laughs> well, you can, I'll just, uh, you can, I think, all hear me. So, are there any questions? Uh, can I ask about. Oh, sorry. Hello, I, I'm Marta I'm Yay. from Cambridge, <laughs> and I'm research data coordinator here. Um, my question is about the survey that you have uh, from the engagement versus uh, top down. So, I was pretty surprised to see that the response for the top down is. Uh, it has so much failure. Why is it so? Is it because the researchers just say, no, I won't do it? And, you know. um, I can't really say why. We, we didn't really go into the specifics why it didn't work. My assumption, I think, is, or from my personal experience, and uh, you might be able to comment, is that uh, um, it's only about like 20% of, of academics that really are interested in being compliant as long as there is no uh, uh, fear of sanctions. Uh, I don't know, Judith, if you can say something from your perspective, but I think the stick only works with um, uh, if there's a bit of more stick behind it, if you want. And I think there, I mean, now we would talk about funder uh, policies, et cetera, but I think 
just telling them, oh, you need to be compliant isn't enough and is, is of no interest to a lot of academics. If you don't know why you need to do it, you're probably not going to do it. And I think it, I think it comes back to the problem that we don't talk about data enough. Mm. We take data for granted a lot of the time rather than thinking about the process that produces good data. Shall I throw it? Oh. Uh, have, you, have you found with the data conversations that you've got people who previously were quite against sort of open data to share things. So when we find, so I'm, I work in genomics and bioinformatics, and we find a lot of people are very afraid of sharing data because they're worried about someone else using their data to do better science than them. And, you know, I think most people in this room know that's mostly paranoia, but it's difficult to overcome that that sort of fear. So have you have you found these conversations actually helpful for for getting convincing people who weren't already somewhat engaged? to be engaged? Well, I, I think it's probably difficult to, uh, to catch, as you say, to get these people actually turn up to these events. We have, we've had um, presentations about data that is not openly available, and, and Jude has given examples of her data, how difficult it is to access. Um, we had uh, a project about Islam on campus, which uh, the data is very sensitive, very controversial. So it's not necessarily that we need only talk about open data, um, we need to talk about data, but I get your point that we, in order to make this really su successful, we would have to catch the ones, but I guess that will be difficult. I mean, we, we want to create a momentum, so for our January um, event, we've already sold kind of more tickets than we had for, for the previous one at that time, so we can see that more people hear about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, see, I, I get your point that it's probably very difficult to convince the ones who simply don't want to share. And I think moving on from what we said at the beginning, it's training the new generation as well. So getting the spin-offs through critical thinking courses in your undergraduate, in your master's, getting PhD students to think about their data and how they can share it right from the beginning, I think will actually have a cumulative effect as we go. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, very interesting. My name is Sasha Zerg. I'm from Roskilde University in Denmark. And we're actually quite recently beginning to talk about data. Uh, our US university is, uh, is at the moment uh, trying to uh, establish a research data management policy. And uh, we have done a course on data management, but it's very difficult to get people interested in talking about data or, uh, and one of the things you were saying as well is what are data? That is one of the first questions that uh, they ask. So I was wondering how did you get people interested or researchers interested in coming to those open conver data conversations? I think from my perspective it's, it's that we actually don't talk about data management. This is not, an, as I said earlier, this is not an RDM event. It's specifically because I know we do have, if we do just normal RDM trainings, <coughs> we, we struggle to get numbers uh, interested. But because we're talking about research, this is a research event, it's not a, da a data management event. And I think that, that's the main thing. And that's what I would recommend maybe to you looking into to have um, more, let researchers talk about their data and their re in the context of their research. And I think that's, that's what interests them. But Yeah, I agree. I think it's, um, it's, it's having the opportunity to talk about data, talk about challenges, talk about different kinds of solutions, and then from there, I think it grows, and you kind of go away and talk to colleagues and say, this was really useful, it was really interesting. I met so-and-so who I think might have connections with you. Why don't you go and find them through the data conversation? And it's, I think it's slow, but then mm. I think it will build as it, like a ripple as it, as it gets further and further out. So yeah, you need a core, I think, of overly enthusiastic mm. people about data and then it, it starts to ripple. Thank you. 